All right, this is part two of chapter 16 lecture. We're starting at concept 16.2 uh, and looking at how uh, DNA replication and repair works. Um, so DNA is a double helix, um, and that double helix enables it to unwind and to replicate uh, through a fairly complex uh, but important process. The two strands of DNA uh, pair with one another, and they are complementary to each other. That doesn't mean they're nice and say, oh, you have such pretty hair. That means they uh, match up, and the A always goes with the T, and so on. Uh, so each strand is a template for building a new one, and when you replicate DNA, each single strand of that double strand will be the template for a new one to be created. So here we have our double strand, uh, our double helix. Uh, it's of course not shown in helical form here. Um, and the A's with the T and so on. Here now they've been opened up into single strands. You'll see the enzyme that does this is called helicase. And then a new strand is laid down in. These are the new daughter strands. Uh, that you see at the end now, and each daughter strand includes uh, one single strand from the original parent. Now, DNA replication is semi-conservative, as we just showed you, uh, which is the middle one here, where the original parent, uh, one from each of the double-stranded parent, becomes uh, part of the daughter strands. Uh, that's as opposed to the conservative model, where the original parent strand stays together, and the two new daughter strands come together. Uh, versus the dispersive model where pieces of the parent strand get intermixed in amongst the uh, daughter strand or the new DNA. We do know it's semi-conservative. Um, and the Messelson-Stahl experiment was the one that helped to uh, confirm this for us, um, where they took uh, bacteria and they grew it on N15. And here they took, they then take that back, took the N15 bacteria now, all of their DNA had heavy nitrogen, and they put that for one, uh, uh, growth cycle on N14. And then they looked at the bacteria, uh, specifically the DNA that was produced on the N14 medium uh, at following centrifuging. And what they found, centrifuging would take the more dense or the heavier DNA and make it go lower. Um, so they centrifuged it for 20 minutes after the first replication, and what they saw was one band. So all the DNA was found in one band or was the same density or weight. They then did a second replication which is 40 minutes, uh, so bacteria reproduce basically about 20 minutes. Uh, some of them are really fast. And after the 40 minutes, the second replication, they saw two bands, one that was less dense or lighter on top, and the same original heavier one. Um, so immediately what that was able to do was after the first replication, they could get rid of the conservative model. Because the conservative model would say that there would be an N14 weight and an N15 weight DNA because the parents would have stayed together. They didn't see that, they saw only one band, so conservative model wouldn't work. Uh, the dispersive model would show one band after the first replication, but after the second replication it would still show one band for the dispersive model. It didn't. Uh, it showed two and therefore the only one that fits is the semi-conservative model with a light and slightly heavier, a mix of N15 and N14. That was the Messelson-Stahl experiment. Now DNA copying or replication works really well and it's really fast. In fact, uh, errors occur uh, essentially every one times ten to the ninth um, additions of a nucleotide, which is pretty crazy that uh, mistakes happen so infrequently. Um, there's a lot of enzymes and proteins associated or that play a role in replication, uh, as well as other ones that play a role in uh, checking the process to make sure that nothing's happened wrong. So to begin with, DNA starts at the origin of replication, which is shown here. Here we, they describe this as a bubble, and within this bubble we have DNA being replicated. This light blue strand is the new DNA being created. Here's the origin of replication. And along the length of a linear chromosome, you have many, many replication bubbles occurring at the same time, which will speed up the, uh, the replication timing or process, um, and eventually leading to two daughter strands, as we know. Now, here we begin talking about the confusing part of replication, and there's one main confusing part that deals with the carbons in the sugar and the orientation of the two strands that they are uh, anti-parallel. So if we look at this strand on the left compared to this strand on the right, we see one nucleotide is a sugar, a phosphate, shown here this circle, and a nitrogenous base. That's one nucleotide. And when we replicate, we add a nucleotide at a time. Here's another nucleotide, a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and the phosphate group here. Um, and when we add the new nucleotide and we attach it to this strand of the growing strand, the new one, we can only attach a new nucleotide to the three prime end of the growing strand. Now this is crucial. What does the three prime end mean? 
We touched on it briefly in part one, but the three prime end refers to the third carbon in the sugar ring, okay? The five prime end refers to the five prime carbon or the fifth carbon. So here in this sugar, if I'm showing you, this uh, pentose right here that you see, uh, the number ordering, uh, this here, this little kink that's connected to the phosphate there is the fifth carbon. This is the fourth carbon. This is the third, no, uh, yeah, this is the third carbon. So in this next picture, it shows a little bit better what we're looking at. Here's that kink that I was showing you. This is the fifth carbon that's part of this uh, sugar ring, if you like. Carbon five, carbon four, carbon three. Carbon three is where we would attach a new nucleotide. So here's guanine. This nucleotide got attached to this one by taking the five prime end and the phosphate group attached to the five prime and combining it or bonding it to the three prime end of this sugar. And the reason is because only the three prime end, as you see here, this three prime OH, this is where um, a new nucleotide can be added to because the fifth carbon or the five prime carbon is already bonded to something. It already pre-exists as part of this strand. This is the available area to attach one to. So there's two ways that people describe this. They say uh, DNA replication works by attaching a new nucleotide to the available three prime end, or they say that DNA replication works in the five prime to three prime direction, always in the five to three direction. As I continue to add nucleotides on here, the strand will elongate in the five to three direction. This is the new strand, of course, being created that's shown here. This is the new strand being shown there. This is the parent template that's being copied. The thing that adds the nucleotides is called DNA polymerase. There's multiple types of polymerases. The one that adds each nucleotide specifically is called DNA polymerase 3. And that polymerase only adds nucleotides to the free 3 prime end. Um, you'll also see that there is DNA polymerase 1 and DNA polymerase 2. Um, which also only add nucleotides to the free three prime end of a growing strand, um, but they all serve different functions in different places in regards to replication. Now, uh, one thing we're going to talk about now is because DNA is anti-parallel, that is the double strand, the three prime and five prime go opposite directions. So if you look here, here's this double strand. This is the five prime end, so this one's anti-parallel. This is the three prime end, and this three prime end, it's anti-parallel side this would be the three, the three prime end of the new strand, and this is the five prime end of the parent strand, anti-parallel. So DNA polymerase synthesizes a complementary strand continuously moving towards the replication fork. Now the one that moves towards the replication fork is easy and it elongates straightforward, one nucleotide at a time. We call this the leading strand, okay? The lagging strand is the one that's complicated because the lagging strand works in the opposite direction of the opening elongation fork. Um, sometimes it's good, a good idea to look at animations. You can YouTube some animations on DNA replication and it shows the production of the lagging strand um, for anti-parallel DNA quite nicely. Um, because the lagging strand goes away from the replication fork, um, as DNA continues to be opened, um, the leading strand keeps going continuously, but the lagging strand is discontinuously and it's made in fragments that are called Okazaki fragments. And those fragments are then later at the end joined by DNA glue, which is called DNA ligase, another enzyme in the process. So here we see at the top the leading strand, 5' prime to 3' prime going towards the replication fork, or as this zipper keeps opening up, this enzyme, DNA polymerase 3, will just keep going in the 5 to 3 direction. Well, on the other strand, the lagging strand, DNA polymerase 3 also still works in the 5 to 3 direction, continuously adding a new nucleotide onto the free three prime end, but as new DNA gets opened up here, as you see, we have to lay down a new set of DNA, a new fragment of DNA. And that new fragment is an Okazaki fragment, and then that fragment will get glued to this other one. Here you see a gap shown between this fragment and this fragment. DNA ligase, this other enzyme being shown in the background there, will glue those two together and create a phosphodiester bond between the two. Um, but again, Leading strand works continuously. Lagging strand discontinuously because it's going away from the replication fork, and thus it makes Okazaki fragments. 
Uh, we've already said that first part. So because DNA can, because polymerases can only add nucleotides to a three prime end, we need to provide a starting three prime end for the growing strand, for the new strand. And that's done by laying down a primer. Now there's an enzyme called uh, primase. Primase is basically a DNA polymerase. Uh, it's DNA polymerase two and it lays down an RNA or DNA primer. Quite often it's an RNA primer that binds to the DNA and provides an available three prime end to add new nucleotides to. Okay? On the lagging strand, we have to add one after the other many, many primers. As new DNA is exposed of the lagging strand, we have to add a new primer each time, a new three prime end to elongate the strand from. The leading strand starts with just one primer and then it keeps going towards the replication fork. So here's what it looks like. Here's our primer. This is actually an RNA primer that's laid down by primase there in pink. That primer provides a three prime end shown right there for DNA polymerase to start elongating from. Remember you attach a new nucleotide to the three prime end, to that three prime OH of the sugar. Um, because this is the lagging strand, this is making an Okazaki fragment. As new DNA gets exposed, we have a new primer that gets laid down over here, then adding in the five to three direction um, this little fragment. We then need to replace this RNA with DNA, and that's done with uh, DNA polymerase one. That RNA gets converted into DNA, and then we have to glue them together, uh, this Okazaki fragment and this Okazaki fragment, using DNA ligase. And that is essentially what is uh, describing or being described to all these three things. Um, here we have DNA polymerase one, replacing the RNA of the primer with DNA, adding to the three prime end of fragment two, and then DNA ligase joins them, as I mentioned. Now you have a complete strand. So here's all the enzymes that we need to know what they do in replication. Helicase unwinds the double helix. Single strand binding proteins, or SSBs for short, hold open the single strands of DNA for replication because those two strands of DNA have an affinity for one another. They'll bind together or re-anneal, as we say. So we have to hold them apart so that all this replication machinery can fit inside. Uh, that's S done by SSBs. Topoisomerase helps to correct the overwinding of the replication fork, so it helps to unwind, un undo the twisting, if you like, and then helicase will cut it open or open the um, the hydrogen bonds between the, the two strands. Primase, as we said, lays down the primer to provide a three prime end. DNA polymerase three synthesizes the leading strand and lagging strand. DNA polymerase one replaces the primer with uh, the RNA primer with DNA. And then DNA ligase glues them together. Here's a big summary of all the things, both the leading strand on the top going from right to left, and the lagging strand on the bottom going from left to right. And this is zooming in on the process so you can see what's happening in each case with some explanations that you can look on your own. I don't need to uh, detail that too much. Uh, so th all these things together form a replication machine at, that's pretty uh, good at doing its job, but sometimes it makes mistakes. So we already mentioned DNA polymerase one. It replaces the RNA primer, but it also replaces any incorrect nucleotides. It's kind of like the fact checker. Anytime there's a mistake, DNA polymerase one will help to remove the incorrect nucleotide and put in the correct one. Um, so we call this mismatch repair of DNA where we correct the errors in base pairing. You can see here, when there's a mismatch, we form this little um, bubble that you can see there um, because the, um, for example, this is supposed to be A and T, but instead it's A and G, so uh, you don't get the, a strong bond between them and thus you see a little bubble as a result. DNA polymerase one, sorry, not DNA polymerase one, a nuclease comes in and excises or cuts out that short fragment, and then DNA polymerase one comes in and replaces those incorrect ones with the correct nucleotides, and then DNA ligase glues that together, specifically here. Ligase glues the five prime and three prime end um, together uh, to make a continuous strand, and this is why DNA replication is such a a uh, near perfect process. Um, now every time we do replication, um, the uh, DNA strand, the ends of the DNA, the ends of the chromosome, if you like, get shorter with every replication. So every cell has only a certain number of replications that it can go through 
before it starts cutting into DNA that's important and the cell will die or commit cell suicide. And the reason is because this very last fragment here on the lagging strand, we've added a primer to provide a three prime end here. This end of the red primer is a three prime end and DNA polymerase three will add one nucleotide at a time doot, 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 to create this fragment. Now, when DNA polymerase one wants to remove this RNA primer and replace it with DNA, the DNA polymerase does not have a three prime end to attach to or to put a new nucleotide on. So this little end where this RNA primer was does not get newly synthesized. And after another round of replication, the new daughter strand will have this piece not copied, as you can see there. So every time replication occurs because of this lagging strand and the need for a three prime end, DNA strands get shorter and shorter. So we have an evolutionary adaptation to deal with this, those being telomeres. Now telomeres are sequences of DNA on the ends of chromosomes that you can see actually fluorescing here that have been tagged on each end of each chromosome um, that are there to prevent the shortening of the chromosomes from cutting into important regulatory elements or genes necessary for the cell's survival. Um, as soon as the telomeres get cut away over a certain number of replications, then the cell will die, as we mentioned previously. Now, there's an enzyme called telomerase, which helps to maintain the length of telomeres. So as they get shorter, telomerase elongates those telomeres to keep them intact, to keep those cells alive. So there's a lot of research ongoing with telomerase and aging, where if you can keep telomerase activated or high, then you can prevent yourself from aging. Um, we do know that as you get older, your levels of telomerase or your telomerase activity goes down. So people are trying to maintain high levels of telomerase activity. Um, the problem with that is cancer also shows very high levels of telomerase activity. So if you are activating or enhancing telomerase to maintain the length of telomeres, are you also then uh, promoting the formation of cancer? Uh, interesting topics, and we'll talk more at a later date about telomeres. On that note, we are done.